Luckily, the Biden team actually anticipated that this would happen. They worked on ascertainment for months and anticipated virtually everything that happened and put in place plans to mitigate the impact of problems with the outgoing Trump presidency. They anticipated every single thing except for one thing, January 6th. So they figured out how to deal with the fact that briefings would be delayed, that they might not get access to federal funds to pay staff. Really, Jeff Zients and Ted Kaufman and Johannes did a brilliant job figuring out what might happen. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 17th, 2022. Presidential transitions are the most delicate and hazardous periods in the entire political cycle. Even at the best of times, incoming administrations face a huge task. Each new president must make more than 4,000 political appointments in a short period of time, as well as get up to speed on ongoing policy issues. To discuss the history and the current framework of presidential transitions, I sat down with David Marchik, who's the Dean of American University's Kogood School of Business, and previously served as the director of the Center for Presidential Transition at the Partnership for Public Service. He also is the author of The Peaceful Transfer of Power, an oral history of America's presidential transitions, and the host of the Transition Lab podcast. We discussed examples of effective and ineffective recent transitions, the role of everyone from outgoing presidents to the GSA to agency teams, and what else might be done to nail down best practices for presidential transitions. It's the Lawfare Podcast for October 17th, Presidential Transitions with David Marchik. David, I want to start by talking as an overview about the history of presidential transition planning, because for most of American history, we did not have anything like the robust legal framework for presidential transitions that we have now, such that not only when accidental presidents came into office, like John Tyler after William Henry Harrison or Truman after FDR or Johnson after Kennedy, but even the known transitions, the ones after elections, there wasn't anything resembling a smooth transfer of power in administration. And I'm wondering if you could talk through that just a bit to let us all know why you think it took so long into the modern era to start getting serious about presidential transitions. It's it's actually a great question, which I don't really know the answer to. Um, historically, there have been some terrible, terrible transitions going back to the early days where you know, there were disputed elections like in 2020. Mm-hmm. There have been transitions where the outgoing didn't attend the incoming's inauguration. There was total lack of cooperation. Right. Actually, Harry Truman was the first modern president to try to get something going when he left office. As you recall, he was only in office for 75 or 80 days as vice president before he took over as president. And FDR kept him in the dark, Mm -hmm. including about the nuclear bomb. So when he was preparing to leave office, he basically said, and I have a quote here, which is, whoever's elected in the fall, I don't want him to face the same kind of thing that I faced when I came into office, completely being unbriefed and unprepared. Mm -hmm. So Truman actually reached out to Eisenhower um, and Adlai Stevenson, the Democratic candidate, and encourage them both to take briefings, to come in, to, to learn about the government. And Eisenhower refused. He thought it would look untoward and presumptuous. That was 1952, I'm sorry. So fast forward to the 1960 election, which was very close, much like the 2020 or the 2000 election. Mm-hmm. And some of Nixon's advisors actually encouraged him to do what Trump did, which was to dispute the outcome of the election. Congress, seeing that in 1963, passed the first presidential transition legislation, which created a process for the handoff. But up until then, there never was any formal legislative process. It was really dependent on the personality of the president, right? So that you could have some presidents like Hoover, who were essentially actively lobbying against the new president's policies to the incoming president and saying, you really need to do what I tell you. And then, of course, you do get the Truman who says, 
no, 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 for the good of the country, we really need to have something, even if it's not legislated yet. Exactly. The first modern president to actually devote resources and staff to transition planning was Jimmy Carter. You recall he was an engineer. He was a planner. And Stu Eisenstadt actually was interviewed for the book. He was domestic policy advisor on the campaign and then also in the White House. And David Rubenstein was his deputy. They basically said Carter wanted to plan this out. So Carter established a transition planning group. He had about 50 people. He devoted resources to it. There was one problem. He didn't tell the campaign <laughs> that the transition existed. Right. So about 10 days before the election, the Washington Post and New York Times started reporting about plans for Carter post-election. And the campaign staff said, what's going on here? We don't know anything about this. So Stu Eisenstadt went to Carter and said, do you know where these stories are coming from? And Carter said, oh, yeah, I have a whole transition operation led by Jack Watson. And that created a clash. So the transition team and the campaign team were competing for ideas, resources, and positions. And Stu says in my book that it actually impeded the first year of Carter's presidency, if not more. Mm -hmm. So Carter really is the first president to allocate resources and staff to transition planning. And I got to say that that makes sense from, from my limited vantage point on this, which is the intelligence side, because... Jimmy Carter, when he came into office, was the first president to receive from the outgoing administration a very early intelligence briefing. And when I say outgoing administration, I mean Ford didn't know he was going to be going out yet because Jimmy Carter asked for his first intelligence briefing as a candidate even before his formal nomination to be the Democratic Party candidate. And Ford and Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor, agreed that the Director of Central Intelligence, uh, George H.W. Bush, could go and brief Carter, but they told him, just talk about the outlines of the kinds of briefings he will get after becoming the nominee. Well, Bush exceeded his mandate and ended up using that early session to talk about a whole range of intelligence issues. So I have a feeling that in addition to his engineer background and his very meticulous planning that was just part of who Carter was, that he also realized there is a real benefit to getting some early preparation on substantive issues as well as organizational issues. And then he puts it into practice so that the incoming Reagan team had a better start than they would have otherwise. You're exactly right. And intelligence briefings are one of the key aspects of planning for a new president. The law actually allows for the candidates to be briefed by the intelligence community post-convention, pre-election. Mm -hmm. They get general briefings, not very detailed. Of course, Vice President Biden, when he was candidate Biden, <laughs> had a long history of being briefed by intelligence agencies for 40 plus years. Interestingly, after the election, the law leaves it totally up to the president of the United States of how much, whether, and when the president-elect gets briefed. Mm -hmm. Trump, during the disputed part of the election before the formal transition launched did not really give access to those briefings for President Biden. Yeah. Interestingly, if you go back to the Clinton-Bush transition, where obviously you had Bush v. Gore, something that your podcast and, and Lawfare mm -hmm. has written about a lot, Clinton decided, actually John Podesta was the chief of staff, pushed him to do this, that even during the disputed election, that Governor Bush and Vice President Gore should both get the same briefings. And that was a very prescient and thoughtful decision by President Clinton and John Podesta, because eventually George W. Bush became president, and he benefited from having those briefings during the 37 or 38 days of Bush v. Gore before the Supreme Court decided the outcome of that election. Right on. Well, we, we've already started talking about some of these great transitions, and I have a feeling we'll be using them to highlight some of the the facts and the structures here, but let's fast forward to now just as a different way of setting the stage. So what is the basic process for transitioning presidential administrations that begins many months before the election? And how much of it is on the candidate and the people around the candidate to do versus how much right now is it up to the General Services Administration and others in the U.S. government itself? 
So let's start with the stakes and why a smooth handover of power is important. I'm the, now the dean of a business school. If I designed the presidential transition the way it is organized, I should be fired. Because essentially, you have 75 or 77 days for an entire top level of a government to leave and for a new level of the government to come in. A new president has 4,000 political appointees. 1,250 of them need to be confirmed by the Senate. He supervises or she supervises a multi-trillion dollar budget, 4 million employees, including 2 million civilians. And we know from history that this transition period is a time of great vulnerability for the country. Josh Bolton, former White House Chief of Staff under Bush, said in my book that it's the most vulnerable time for the country because our adversaries know that there's change and they want to take advantage of it. So you have this compressed period of time where it's virtually impossible for an incoming president to get everything done and they have to prioritize. So really best practice is for the candidates to start planning their transition in the spring mm -hmm. and beef up their staff from the spring all the way up to November and then all the way up to January 20th. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but traditionally in just American political culture, that was strongly frowned upon because it looked like they were, quote, measuring the drapes already, that it was undue optimism, maybe even arrogance about the result of the campaign. And it reflected poorly on the candidate for the election itself. But now that it has legislation behind it, it's removed that stigma, right? Exactly. And this is an area where you're an expert in national security and law. Actually, again, it goes back to the George W. Bush transition to power. Because of Bush v. Gore, he only had 35 days instead of the normal 77 days. It therefore was slower for him to get his government in place. He only had 40 or 50 Senate confirmed officials in place at the 100-day mark, and only a couple hundred by 100 days into his presidency. Yeah. Eight months after he became president, two planes hit the World Trade Center, one plane hit the Pentagon, and one plane crashed in the western Pennsylvania. And when the 9-11 Commission did the autopsy of what happened on 9-11, they found that the delayed transition imperiled our national security because President Bush did not have adequate time to get his top team in place. Throughout the government, he only had secretaries and deputy secretaries in place, not the next layer or two layers of government. And half of the national security officials in the government on 9-11 had been there for less than two months. Mm -hmm. So Congress, because of the 9-11 Commission, passed a series of laws that basically tried to reverse that presumption. They wanted to make it a presumption that a candidate should prepare for a transition and eliminate the stigma associated with it being presumptuous. And so now the law actually creates incentives for a candidate to prepare, and that's positive. So what is the structure that's built around that. I know it involves a bunch of government entities that are relatively poorly known to the general public, things like the Office of Presidential Personnel and the General Services Administration. And then some of it actually does fall on the campaign or more accurately, the candidate uh, and others separated from the campaign. Talk through that a little bit. Build for us the architecture of who works on transition issues from that time ideally from the early spring until election day and afterward. Sure. And let me give a shout out to the organization that I worked with during the transition, the Center for Presidential Transition, which is part of the Partnership for Public Service, which pushed Congress to adopt these laws. So let me enumerate some of the requirements under the law. First, the outgoing White House has to organize a transition, two different transition councils, one inside the White House and one with all the agencies that essentially mandates the government to be ready for, for a new president, mandates briefing books to be developed, memos to be written. It requires them to be prepared to work with the incoming nominees to let them know, here are the big issues in the department, here are the big issues that are coming down the pike, mm -hmm. here are some risks that you need to deal with. 
It also requires a so-called tabletop national security exercise where the outgoing national security team meets with the incoming national security team and does a kind of tabletop exercise or, or disaster planning exercise to help the new incoming team get ready and also to create some, some connective tissue between the outgoing and the incoming. It requires the Department of Justice to provide security clearances for campaign staff members of the challenging campaign or the non-incumbent campaign so that the day after the election, they can be ready to receive security briefings and intel briefings and start their work. And indeed, that allows for staff members to be sit in on intelligence briefings that happen during the campaign. And then it also provides the, the General Service Administration, which is essentially provides real estate support for the entire federal government. They provide both offices, computers, cell phones or mobile devices, and also support for salaries for the transition. Hmm. Prior to the election, they provide office space, computers, and technology. Mm -hmm. After the election, they actually pay the transition staffers salaries. Again, the goal of the legislation was to create a smoother transition of power, but also to reverse this presumption that candidates should not plan. Right. The legislation pushes them to plan. Right. Well, what's interesting is as the former director of the Center for a Presidential Transition, that as you mentioned, is part of the Partnership for Public Service, but as host of the Transition Lab podcast, you had the opportunity to speak with people who have been involved with presidential transitions from the candidate side, from the outgoing administration side, from the civil servant side, going back, what, about 40 years and capturing a whole bunch of institutional knowledge so that that does not get lost. And I'd like to talk through some of those. Let's, let's start by talking about the best case scenario. And I think in most ways, one of the best cases, the gold standard, was the transition from the Bush 43 administration to the Obama administration, in part because there was so much going on with global financial crisis, because there were two wars going on, and because you had direct word from the outgoing president, this is going to be a smooth, helpful transition, and I don't want any silliness getting in the way of it. Talk through the details there. What actually worked well on the personnel side, the policy side, to make the transition from Bush 43 to Obama that gold standard in so many ways? So it starts with President George W. Bush, who suffered from a shortened transition. He had 35 days instead of the normal 75 or 77 days. That slowed his team getting put in place. 9-11 happened eight months later. Fast forward to the year before Bush leaves office, he asks his chief of staff, Josh Bolton, who is a wise and, and capable political professional lawyer, he basically said, I want to make sure the next president has a red carpet coming into office, much like Harry Truman wanted to do, but, but was not successful. So Josh started to organize the cabinet agencies, the White House, put processes in place, he dreamed up this idea of having this tabletop exercise on a terrorist threat to the United States. And he also reached out to both campaigns, the McCain campaign and the Obama campaign, in the summer of that year and said, we're going to provide you with briefings, intel, access to the government on an equal basis in a fair way so the next president is ready. Mm -hmm. He did this because we were fighting two wars at the time, Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, fast forward to the fall of 2008, the global financial crisis hits. So this is the worst financial crisis, economic crisis that we faced since the Great Depression. And there's a presidential election going on. Legislation was passed in the fall of that year for $700 billion through what was no known as TARP. And it needed to be implemented that the auto industry was collapsing, banks were collapsing. It was very much like what happened during the 1932 to 1933 recession, where the wheels came off the bus and Hoover and Roosevelt did not cooperate. Mm -hmm. So 
On the flip side, Obama had a very organized transition. John Podesta was his transition chair. They learned the lessons from the, the Clinton mistakes, the Carter mistakes, and others. And they had a very, very organized, efficient process. So what was the result? Unlike the 1932 to 1933 transition, where a historian that I interviewed on the podcast, Eric Rauschway, said that the poor transition slowed economic recovery, caused more banks to fail, caused more houses to be foreclosed, and ultimately, because there was a food shortage, Americans were starving, it caused more people to die. The cooperation between outgoing President Bush and incoming candidate and President-elect Obama actually helped shorten and reduce the impact of the financial crisis Mm -hmm. and help get our country back on a path to recovery faster than it would otherwise. And that really is a credit to both outgoing President Bush, Josh Bolton, incoming President Obama, and John Podesta. What's funny about that, David, is the the wide divergence between the public impression of that transition and what actually happened in, in almost every case. So the news stories, as I'm sure you recall, we heard the stories about some of the keyboards at the White House having the letter W removed. And Josh Bolton told you for the book that his phone number had been secretly forwarded to another number. So he wasn't receiving any calls when he moved into his office. But he attributes that to, you know, some of the younger staff, you know, pulling juvenile pranks and points out that that was magnified by the media and was not representative of the amazing effort of all of the actual leaders of agencies and departments that were exceedingly cooperative. Yes. You know, the press made a big deal of the W's and there were some pranks, but overall, you know, the cooperation was, was pretty good at the high levels. You know, you recall, you're talking about the 2000 election. You had a sitting vice president that was running for office yeah. and that lost the election by 537 votes in one state. Mm-hmm. So that stuck with Bush and Bolton, and they were determined to make it better for the next president, whether it was the Republican or Democrat. I actually, on the podcast, I, I asked Josh, I said, wasn't it difficult for Bush to cooperate with Obama because Obama essentially was running against Bush in the election, and the whole campaign was just about how bad Bush was. And Josh said, well, actually, you remember in 2008, Bush was so unpopular that both McCain and Obama were running against Bush. So it was you know, equal, equal attribution. Yeah, it made it easier in some ways. But that's not to say that when the outgoing president has a very clear favorite, um, that it's going to go smoothly. Because you go back a few years to 1988, 1989, and you have the eight-year vice president, George H.W. Bush, who wins the election and is succeeding to the presidency. And he comes into office, but it's a lot more tense than people would think to have the transition. Why was that? It's a great question. And and Andy Card is really the the guru on this. I had him on Transition Lab, the podcast. So what happened there was that, you know, Reagan had all his team in place. He actually, the outgoing chief of staff sent a memo to the cabinet and all the political appointees asking for their resignations so that the new president, George H.W. Bush, could put his people in place. And a lot of the officials just ignored that. They said, oh, well, Bush is a Republican. He's vice president. I'm part of the team, so he'll keep me. So Andy basically said that you know it was theoretically a friendly takeover, but it was really a hostile takeover mm-hmm. in some ways because – when you have a change of party, everybody expects to leave. But when you have a similar party, a change to the same party, they expect to stay. And so it was a rough transition in some ways. And George H.W. Bush wanted to appoint new people to both signal his change in direction and also that he was different from Reagan. Hmm. So famously, Mm -hmm. as you know, he appointed, I think, what was perhaps one of the best national security teams ever to be put in place with Brent Scowcroft and Jim Baker and Dick Cheney and Colin Powell. And that was a big change in direction from the Reagan years. So we talked about the the good news story, and then there are others, but one of the good news stories being the 
George W. Bush to Barack Obama transition. We, we have to balance that with a modern case that didn't go so well, despite the existence of legislation and despite something like the Center for Presidential Transition being there to help. The most recent presidential transition we had from Donald J. Trump to, to Joe Biden didn't go so well. Uh, break that down for us and talk about what what should have happened and where it was falling apart and why. So again, let's set the scene because transitions come at perilous times for the United States, even in good times. But this transition, the country faced the most harrowing circumstances that a new president faced since Roosevelt. So we had four crises going on at the same time. We had an economic crisis, 11 million Americans were out of work. Mm -hmm. We had a COVID crisis, the pandemic. Actually, during the transition period, 172,000 Americans died. Yeah. 172,000 between November 5th or 6th and January 20th. We had a racial justice crisis uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And we had a constitutional and political crisis where, for the first time in history, an outgoing president refused to recognize the outcome of the election. And here, let me refer to another guest on my podcast, Ken Burns. He was actually on twice. He was on once in the summer of the election where he basically kind of said, Dave, you know, you're focused on making transitions better and that kind of minutia, but let's look back on history. There's been an unbroken streak of smooth handoffs of power. Presidents may not have wanted to leave, but they've left. No arms were ever raised, no troops were alerted, no shots have been fired. I had Ken on after January 6th, and I said, Ken, what about this statement that you made? And he said, I was wrong. This is one of the worst crises the country has seen, mm -hmm. where an outgoing president fails to recognize the democratic fundamentals of our country, where troops were alerted, shots were fired, and Americans died during a presidential transition. So I talk about this transition as the good, the bad, the ugly. Actually, the good was the pre-election period, where in the White House, there's a fellow named Chris Liddell, who mm -hmm. was the deputy chief of staff. He faithfully implemented the law. He basically, under the radar, without focus, without press, did what was required of the law, organized the transition councils, worked with the agencies, got everything ready. And on the other side of the uh, ledger was, was Joe Biden, who was running with the more experience than any other president or presidential candidate in history. And he had a trio of people, Ted Kaufman, former senator, Jeff Zients, who is an organizational guru, and Johannes Abraham, who is a rising star, Harvard Business School grad. They organized the largest, most effective transition in history, commensurate with the challenges for the time that Biden was going to face. So that's the good. The bad was this period after the election when the head of the GSA, the General Service Administration, refused to ascertain, that's the legal standard, that Joe Biden had won and delayed the transition for 30 to, to 40 days. Let me press pause there, Dave, because yes. that's probably the first time that most Americans outside of the small circle of presidential transition nerds like us heard the word ascertainment and had to struggle with this idea of, so who gets to decide who the president-elect is? Talk about why that was actually an issue, what the legislation says or doesn't say about ascertainment and why the head of the GSA, who most people don't know who that is, had such power to affect the, the forward movement of the U.S. government. So the legal standard is that the head of the General Service Administration should, quote, ascertain the outcome of the election. There's no real legislative history behind <laughs> that. It. Yeah. And, you know, it basically is, you know, you know it when you see it. Typically, one looks to the networks, the states, what they said. Here you had a head of an agency who I think, you know, is a good person who was put in a terrible position by her president. It was not supposed to be a political decision. It's about giving out real estate and office space and cell phones. But it became a political decision 
And she refused to ascertain the outcome, even though Biden was the clear winner by the Saturday after the election, when a few states had counted their votes. So pressure built, a campaign was put in place, and you know there was this delay at a time of crisis, at a time when Americans were dying, at a time when our national security was at risk. And every day in a transition counts. And it was really, you know, a shame that there was this delay. Luckily, the Biden team actually anticipated that this would happen. They worked on ascertainment for months and anticipated virtually everything that happened and put in place plans to mitigate the impact of problems with the outgoing Trump presidency. They anticipated every single thing except for one thing, January 6th. So they figured out how to deal with the fact that briefings would be delayed that they might not get access to federal funds to pay staff. Really, Jeff Zients and Ted Kaufman and Johannes did a brilliant job Mm -hmm. figuring out what might happen. They had a whole team to work on this, and they mitigated as much of the damage as possible. And I think that was one of the most insightful conversations among many that you had with Senator Ted Kaufman. And the way you described it, how, how Kaufman had broken up his team's workflow into two streams, one for the conventional problems, the ones that every transition faces having to do with agency review and policy and appointments and all of this, but then a whole team set up for unconventional challenges, meaning you know what, what could President Trump or those around him create? That actually is, is good foresight. You can't predict everything, as you mentioned, January 6th itself, not so much. But it helped them get ahead of some of these issues in a way that I'm not sure people knew was going on. I give them great credit. They had a team of really smart people sit down and kind of tabletop every scenario. What happens if there's a delay? What happens if we can't get our people in place? What happens if we don't get the briefing books? What happens if we don't get access to federal funds? What happens if we don't get access to intelligence? And they basically built mitigation strategies for each of these risks. The biggest risk they faced, outside of you know, a constitutional crisis, of course, was personnel. That ultimately is the most important yeah. element of a transition. 4,000 political appointees, 1,250 needed to be confirmed. Okay. So what Ted and Jeff and Johannes did to mitigate is they focused on on getting as many non-confirmed officials in place. So you have cabinet secretaries and deputy secretaries and undersecretaries, but then you have chiefs of staff and general counsels and heads of offices and other, lots of other people that hold important jobs. They said, we're going to flood the zone with non-confirmed officials because we know it's going to take a long time to get our, our, political appointees in place that require Senate confirmations. Right. So during the transition, this 77 days, they did 8,000 interviews and they ended up by January 30th of the year that Biden took office. So 10 days after uh, the election, they ended up having 1,100 officials in place that were non-Senate confirmed. That's more than Trump and Obama had in place at that time combined. So they, they really get credit for prescience, organization, and imagination to think about all the bad things that could happen. Mm -hmm. There's one aspect here that I think we need a little bit more background on to understand just, just how impressive that effort was. Could you describe what the agency review and agency teams are during a presidential transition? Yes. Okay. So there's something like 450 to 500 agencies and sub-agencies for the government. Yeah. You know the big ones, Department of State, Department of Defense, et cetera. But there are a lot of other agencies. A conventional workflow is to have agency review officials basically do planning, put memos together for the incoming officials, and then post-election, those agency review teams go to the agencies, meet with outgoing officials, meet with career officials, and get a lay of the land so they can brief the secretaries, the deputy secretaries, and others who are going to start running those agencies on January 20th or soon thereafter. Again, 
the Biden team deserves enormous credit. They said, we need to flood the zone. And so they said, we're going to cover more than 100 agencies. The previous record was 62 by Obama. Trump covered 42 agencies. So again, they did two and a half times the level of agency review efforts that, that Trump did. And they basically had these folks do memos and prepare as if they would not get access to the agencies, anticipating the problems that they actually encountered wow. when Trump delayed the formal launch of the transition. And then even once the transition was launched, some of the agency heads refused to cooperate with Biden. So DOD, USTR, the Office of Management and Budget, there was very little cooperation among those agencies. Chris Liddell, the outgoing deputy chief of staff, said, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the agencies cooperated. There were a few that were reluctant and I could push them. And, you know, there were a handful. They just said, we're not going to cooperate with Biden. We don't agree with him. And it's not our job. Actually, it is their job. It's required under law. Mm -hmm. And it's good for the country. I think something that that you note that is also underappreciated is the fact that this largest agency transition team ever for the Trump to Biden transition with what 600 officials covering all of these agencies and departments that they didn't leak anything that you had some very experienced reporters saying that they're not getting anything out of the Biden team they're they're totally disciplined I know in my case I have several close friends who were on some of the agency teams, and there was not a single word about anything they were doing, anything they were considering. It was a very tight ship. And I think that contributed to the credibility of the process as it went forward, right? It did. And let me again give Ted Kaufman, Jeff Science, and Johannes credit here. So I actually met with Ted in March of 2020 to start planning the transition. And the first thing we did was we talked about culture in a transition, and we talked about the characteristics of the leaders they should appoint, okay? And Ted and Jeff and Johannes, one of the first things they did was they said, let's focus on the culture and the rules for the transition. And they came up with a few. Number one was what happens in the transition stays in the transition. No leaks. Number two is the campaign comes first. We can plan a perfect transition, but if we don't win, it doesn't matter. Number three is that there needs to be seamless coordination between the campaign and the transition. There can't be rivalries. There can't be problems. And number four is that the transition team should mirror America. It should be diverse. It should look like America. And I give them credit for executing all these. And reporters would call me all the time. You know, the Trump transition was a field day for reporters. They loved it because there was leaks and they could get out information and there were rivalries. Ted and Jeff and Johannes created a culture that was just tight, tight as ever. And there were no leaks. We talked about the um, disciplined and effective incoming team in 2020. 2021 with, let's say, mixed cooperation from the outgoing administration. But let's invert that. Let's go four years earlier when instead you had a disciplined and effective outgoing administration when it comes to the transition, the Obama team basically saying what happened to us when we came into office from George W. Bush, we want to replicate that professionalism for the incoming administration. But you did not have a disciplined, effective operation for the incoming administration. Talk about what the Trump transition team, such that it was after the election, what did it do that did not build on the best practices of effective transitions previously? Okay, so let's start with the positive. Chris Christie, governor, former governor of New Jersey, and Rich Bagger, who was his chief of staff, who's a very distinguished and, and impressive lawyer, they ran the Trump transition pre-election. They did a really good job. They were organized. They consulted with other experts. They put together a good team. Two days after the election, there's, this is in the book and it's a great story. 
Steve Bannon at Trump Tower calls Chris Christie in and says, we need to make some changes in the transition. And Christie said, okay, what? And he said, you, you're out. And so Christie was fired and they literally threw out all the binders, all the work. They said every, anything that Christie did is history. Vice President Pence became the head of the transition, but they basically you know, threw everything out. They weren't prepared. And so actually Michael Lewis, the famous author who has written about baseball and Moneyball and, mm-hmm. and Wall Street, he wrote a book called The Fifth Risk, which was about the transition mm-hmm. from Obama to Trump. And he basically tells the story that the Obama people did exactly what George W. Bush did on the way out, maybe even a little better. Uh, They were prepared. They had memos. They had offices. They wanted to cooperate. And the Trump people never showed up. And he gives just a great example where the day after the 2008 election, Obama sent 30 agency transition officials to the Department of Energy, 30. Okay. Trump's team didn't arrive for weeks. Mm. And the head of the transition didn't even meet with Ernie Moniz, who was the outgoing secretary, for a month after the election. What's incredible in Michael Lewis's book is that perhaps the greatest area of risk from the energy department is the nuclear armaments. There's a fellow named John McWilliams, who was the department's chief risk officer, looking at all the risks that could happen, you know, that could be catastrophic in the country. He never heard from the Trump officials, never was consulted. So essentially, this hurt the Trump team coming in. You know, I asked Chris Christie, what was the impact of the fact that they threw out all the good transition work, didn't have an organized transition? And Chris Christie, who, you know, was one of Trump's earliest and and most vocal supporters, said that Trump never recovered. The administration never recovered. And that's how important a transition is, that it can have an impact on the entire administration. There's so much, uh, including that story, that's in the new book, The Peaceful Transfer of Power, an Oral History of America's Presidential Transitions, that I do hope people will really dig into because it's it's fascinating. But I want to close by taking you above all that and asking you, having having done the presidential transition work at the center and having interviewed so many people who have been involved in it from so many angles, what else might be done, whether legislatively or otherwise, to nail down the best practices for presidential transitions so that we have an even better chance of avoiding a worst case scenario in a future presidential transition? Great question. Okay. So first, the practices and the kind of best practices need to be adopted. So a transition needs to start early. Candidates need to learn from their predecessors. They need to hire the right team and figure out the, the cadence between the campaign and the transition. They need to prioritize above all else, the selection, vetting, and training of political officials. And the outgoing administration needs to be cooperative. Okay. But Congress can do more to strengthen presidential transitions, and this is work that the Partnership for Public Service is pursuing. So the standard for ascertainment needs to be clarified and lowered. We should not have the same situation we had where you have a, you know, a mid-level political official determining whether a transition is going to start based on some uncertain standard called ascertainment. We need to give career civil servants, non-political officials, more authority for the outgoing transition so the political officials can't interfere. Some of the statutory deadlines can be moved up. Intelligence sharing should be mandatory. It shouldn't be discretionary. It should be mandatory. And perhaps most importantly, the personnel process needs to be fixed. The requirement that there are 1,250 political officials that need to be confirmed by the Senate, it just doesn't work. So Just to give you some data, President Biden, you know, he's a pro. He's got a very organized transition. He put great people in the White House. They knew what they were doing, just like George W. Bush did. At the 100-day mark in his presidency, he only had 44 confirmed officials, 44 out of 1,250. At the 200-day mark, only 127 were confirmed. That's 10% 
of the government being in place by kind of September, October of the first year. As you know, David, by January of the second year, people start to leave. They're tired. They want to move on. And so a president can never catch up. So a lot of the positions which require Senate confirmation should not require Senate confirmation. It should be easier for a new president to staff the government without relying on on a confirmation process, which is slow and outdated. That is very useful. And again, I think there's much more in this, but we will cut it off there for now. David, thank you for joining me on the Lawfare Podcast to talk about it. Thanks for having me. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Look, do us a favor. We have several different podcast feeds. You can pick one that fits your style. If you like high-end but friendly banter, go for rational security. If you like one-on-one extended conversations with fascinating people working at the frontiers of national security, go with Chatter. If you want to hear more about accountability for January 6th, you can go to the ongoing series, The Aftermath. We appreciate your support. This podcast episode was edited by Jen Pacha Howell. Your audio engineer this time was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening.